Hi everyone. Uh, thank you for for coming. So for those that they are coming for the first time, uh, we are the Global Value Investing Club, and this is our event in London, obviously. Uh, so we uh, repeat this every time that we can freely talk and uh, say our opinions and present our ideas, but never take what we say as as an advice. Okay. So we, we operate in multiple cities, but the main events are uh, in Malta and here in, in London, the most, the most active ones. You can go and visit uh, our past uh, presentations. You can download them and study them. And also you can go on YouTube and uh, see the recorded uh, version. Uh, also, the same page, cityfalcon.ai slash meetup, you can see the performance uh, of the stocks pre presented, here, uh, presented here. So you can recognize uh, some stocks that uh, basically Rusby presented, I think it was February. It was about AI. <laughs> and this is, you see this green, this green part, which is all these uh, tech companies, the big, the big tech companies. Uh, sadly, a few a few days ago, uh, um, Charlie Munger uh, passed away. Uh, it's somebody that uh, gave a lot of uh, wisdom to us, and we should be grateful. And I think we we should keep uh, uh, a minute of, of silence. So, um, uh, does anyone want to to share wisdom uh, that they have they have got from Charlie or things that you have you have you have learned? Yeah, you, you can you can come here and share it. Um, throw the microphone. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just uh, I've heard the news a couple of days ago uh, it did upset me. I'm sure some of you will have uh, felt the same. Um, I think one thing I've learned from him is to really try and collect big ideas. Um, and that's something I actively started doing a couple of years ago. Um, so to kind of create a catalog of sort of ideas um, and really trying to uh, get to these sort of definitions and try and uh, apply them to my investment ideas as well. Um, so that, that's the main thing I've learned from him. And um, also sort of um, having the confidence and courage in yourself to figure things out. Um, so that'll be the other one. Um, but I think I'll leave, leave it there because there's so many other small anecdotes that he shared over the, over the years that makes so much sense. Yeah, I mean, he 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 has contributed a lot. He has he has transformed uh, uh, Warren Warren Buffett's uh, ways of of investing, and uh, Berkshire wouldn't be wouldn't be the same with with without him. And uh, we will uh, miss him a lot. Uh, as always, uh, we saw the. Um, uh, the S&P 500 performance, uh, which this year has has done pretty pretty well. Uh, any comments on that? Have you seen that? Uh, yeah, you can come closer here if you wish. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah, it's open. That's a stage of different Yeah, no, just really, the thing I'd um, sort of note really, uh, and obviously it's sort of like here, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's what's true. And obviously it's talked about, uh, obviously, the extent to which the mega cat uh, tech stocks are driving the market formats. Um, uh, it's actually maybe quite interesting to note that actually, if you equally weight all the stocks in the SP 500, it's actually down this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's true, and that's why probably those that they are not invested on on tech, they see they see probably a different picture, and I, I also see a different picture. So that's the question: like, um, how many of you uh, have been investing for uh, uh, for more than two years? Like, let's say for from zero to two initially, like from zero to two. So most of you, ah, yeah. So most of you are. Are more experienced two, two to five. Okay, five to twenty. A bit few, and more than twenty. Wow. Okay, <laughs> that's fun. Okay. Uh, also, we had the the Bitcoin. You know that I'm I'm not a, a fan of, of of cryptos, but we have seen we have seen them uh, re rebounding lately. Any any thoughts on those, on that? Um, and I think it's ironic you mentioned Charlie how the that's like rat poison, but apparently the world needs rat poison. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see how how it, it goes. Uh, and we we also had uh, the the Nvidia stock, which is part of the AI hub. We can say that the cryptocurrency was, uh, you know, a product of. Of hype and AI, somebody can say is, has elements of 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 hype, but do you, I, personally, I wouldn't put them at the same at the same bucket. But do you think there is also some uh, exuberance uh, here with 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 Nvidia? Any thoughts on that? Whoever has an opinion, want to talk about? Or do you think that the the, the valuation is uh, excessive or? Okay. Mulder says he, he, he preferred to see some human intelligence, artificial intelligence. That yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, I think that uh, Michael has been right in, in most of the game, but I, I think that many people haven't, haven't really understood yet the, the level of, of change, sure. uh, especially after Chat CPT and LLMs, I think. So I, I don't expect from, from somebody who's that old. I mean, somebody from the crypto uh, industry could also say the same, uh, but but I think it's it's a bit different. And one proof one proof to that is is this one. So okay, this is just a few quarters, but we see the massive uh, the massive uh, growth in in revenue, and that's and that's tangible, right? So in the last quarter, from about five, six, seven, around five, six, seven billion of quarterly revenue, we have gone to, to 20. And okay, this can be just, you know, it can be a bit cyclical and this growth might, might, might continue. And my, my guess is, yeah, yeah. So do you want to come closer so we have that? Exactly. I can see from here, but on the right gray area, are, are those estimates or is it? Uh... Yeah. You, you can be closer, but but yeah, these some of them are their estimates. But okay. the twenty, the twenty uh, billion that I I present here, they they are not estimates. They are true numbers of the the last the last quarter, Q three, fiscal Q three. The rest are are just you know, um, but they are, I think they are booked for for more than a year. So we we can expect that the, the revenue at least will be something like this for the foreseeable. Future. So, I, yeah. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Have thoughts, please. Um, there's a there are a couple of things I can share. Um, I'm actually a data scientist, um, so I have some some insights from my day to day job. Um, I'm I'm personally a bit skeptical about the whole um, chat GPT thing and how much that will provide value for actual customers, but um, I think what, what's happening with NVIDIA is, is, is different than that. I think there's a paradigm shift in how processing happens. Um, and there's a big shift to 
um, prop like GPU processing, which didn't really exist before. Um, and it's also how most machine learning models are, are trained. It's a process called batch processing. Um, but there's something else I can share as well, and that's um, that NVIDIA, I believe, has a sort of temporary monopoly in that a lot of the historic academic work um, has been written in a sort of interface that is unique to NVIDIA. Um, and it also comes from sort of historic video games and a lot of engines that were sort of written to do graphical processing. Um, but I think um, there's a bit of an angle where all of a sudden um, US export uh, restrictions, I believe, will now force China to develop its own technology. Um, and I think that might potentially break um, this temporary monopoly that um, NVIDIA has, because what you start seeing in the Chinese cloud service providers is that they um, are actively developing their own um, like chips, their own um, graphical processing chips, uh, which are based on open source technology called RISC-V. How far away they are from actually creating a breakthrough, I don't know. Uh, but something I can share is that um, in the academic world, Tencent, for example, has a history of 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 having breakthroughs, and they they hold certain records and um, uh, big data processing speeds that few Western companies can actually uh, sort of compete with. So you sure. believe that um, they might they might not be able to keep their their mod their their monopoly. I, I I do think that, but I think what the advantage that Nvidia has because it's yeah um, I don't know enough about Nvidia to share, but I I I, I do know that they're building their own um, sort of GPU cloud to sort of um, sell or like license that uh, capacity to other cloud providers. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, that's the one thing I can't clearly see is um, how long that will last. I, I do not know, but um, the, um, how can you say, the decay in tech is quite high. I, I, I'd say somewhere around the 10% a year. It's not very different from a car, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are some very good, good, deep, deep insights. Um, I'm just, I'm just, and I, I cannot, I, I can agree that uh, mon the monopoly of Nvidia is, is not grounded. Uh, but all these billions that they are about to be spent on, on LLMs and artificial intelligence, mostly will be confused if you think of it. So, of course, they are those that they get the most benefit and probably some. Of some more companies. That's why I I think that in a gold trust, and that's a personal opinion, but I'm sharing some of the stocks that I own because I believe that those that they are selling the servers are more 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 safe options. So I think those that they go one step, they haven't get yet the the benefits of it. So I'm just sharing a few stocks that I that I own as an as an example. You can you can check about them if you want. Uh, also, we have uh, since we are talking uh, on AI, this these crazy events, and I will I will rush it a bit here because we uh, the time has passed a bit. Yeah, so we have these crazy crazy times that uh, you know initially some admin was was fired, then was hired by Microsoft, and then was returned. But who who has followed the story? I think most of you. Yeah, that was that was really. Crazy, and we don't know what what what's the reason yet. We we, we don't know, right? There's a lot of speculation. Do you have any quick comments on that? I can pass the microphone. Any quick comments? No, I think you should watch Elon Musk's interview because he co-founded OpenAI with Sam Altman. Julia Sutskiver. Yeah, she has said something about. It. See last week on uh, Deal Desk uh, uh, in in New York, uh, and it's got to do with. Uh, and it goes into the details of this problem. Yeah, he, he said a few, a few things about it, yeah. So now we have the inflation cooling, which I think it's basically um, 
uh, because the you know the, the months of higher inflation are, are going off the 12 month period so we should we see it cooling um uh, what do you think are the, the reasons that they keep the inflation? Are there the expectations, do you think? Are there the, the geopolitical tensions? Because it's something also that we had, like we have a lot of, like we had also the, um, the Palestine co conflict. Uh, we also have now Venezuela that is threatening. We had a, a friend and they're threatening to invade uh, Guyana. Um, any thoughts on that? Do you think that it's a it's a factor like the, all this spending, all this all this geopolitical shift and uh, tensions affects affects trade and affect uh, and affect the economies? What what do you think about the the state of the economy? And what do you think about the state of the stock market? If anyone wants to have a to share their views, yeah, you can come here. Alex Spence. Yeah, it's just a quick point, really. Uh, I, I guess it's easy to blame foreign power working for inflation, but I feel like there's a lag. I mean, for instance, lots of money during COVID. Inflation is almost inevitable. It's easy to blame Russia or to blame external outside forces, but it seems to me that it's just Simple money printing and its effects. Okay. That's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, so I think now we can we can go to uh, our uh, first presentation. So, Zach, the the stage is is yours. So, okay. so with us we have we have Sack, who is an independent investor. The previous time he presented his his quantitative strategy, and and now it's the time to present an, an example, a low P example. Uh, so yeah, you can. Thanks. Hello, um, I'm gonna talk about. Camera Resources. I don't know if everyone's heard of it or invested in it. Anyone, got, anyone invested in it? Okay. okay. Uh, brilliant. It's a boring company, a boring industry, an exciting price. And that is kind of what I think as value investors we want to see if we're going to something that no one else has uh, got their hooks into as such. Um, do you want metrics first or do you want to know about the company? Because no one knows about it. What do you want, numbers? Company, idea. company first. Yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I can't, it's quite fun. 
No? No, it's not working. Uh, just give me a second. Yeah, it's... Uh, like, you should have gone for m numbers first. <laughs> <laughs> it's not working. Numbers. Numbers. Computers. There we go. Okay. So, this is why it's attractive to me. Um, you can see. Can you read those? You know. Can you see them? Yeah. Okay. So, low PE. Low price to book. Low price to free cash flow. High free cash flow yield. And a high ROE and a high ROC. So, uh, pretty good on those metrics. Uh, you can see the revenue has gone up. We'll get into why it's gone up. Uh, this, oh, I've got those two the wrong way around. Excuse me. They have got those two at the top are wrong. So the, uh, they're the other way around. So uh, 2022 is 2021, 2021 is 2022. <laughs> Any more you catch me out on? <laughs> okay. So it is 2022, they've gone up quite a lot. Um, they have... Yeah, okay. So um, about them, they are small cap, small to mid cap, um, and a minor of titanium dioxide feedstocks, ilmenite and rutile. You know what those are? No one knows what they are. There's titanium dioxide and the zircon fed into something you find in this building um, if you go to the toilets. Uh, yeah. They are, they are yeah. <laughs> they are used in pigments um, and in ceramic tiles. Get onto that in a minute. They've got one mine in Mozambique with a hundred-year mine life and a twenty-year visibility. Yeah, five percent of Mozambique's exports, and they've been operating for fifteen years continuously. This is what they do. They're not a big mine. They're not a, a drill. They uh, dig out um, a kind of lake. Fill it with water, they dredge it, put it into what's known as a wet concentrator plant. Uh, they spin it up and separate out the different minerals. And then they take it to a, a separate plant. I can show you what these look like. So the dredger looks like that. Um, they dredge this pond, feed it into this plant. Uh, and then once it's all separated, they uh, send it to their mineral separation plant. Uh, which separates out the different elements which they can then sell. They don't process them further into tiles and things, pigments. Um, and that's what they do. They've got three of these dredges and, and plant setups uh, in operation at the moment. They started off with one. Uh, and then when they've got that stuff, they put it onto transshipment vessels, which are to get it to other ships um, and transfer it out of the country. So that's what that looks like. I didn't even know what transship vessels were before I started looking at this. So they can take a large volume. They used to have like 600 odd ships coming into port and pick it up a little bit. So now what they do is they take a whole load of it, put it on one of their vessels. They've got two of their own, uh, and then they distribute it out and they find it easier to work that way. So uh, Ilmenite and Rutile are feedstocks for the production of titanium dioxide and titanium metal. So. Most of it goes into pigments, paint, uh, plastics, rubber, toothpaste even, although the EU is now talking about banning it because they're not sure about toxicity. Um, so it's not affected by fashion, but it is affected by macro conditions. So constructions where you use paint, uh, tiling a lot, that's a big risk. 83% uh, of the demand is from Asia Pacific, including China, and 23% is from North America. So you've got that sign of, you know, construction goes one way in one area, hopefully it won't go in both. Um, what I am going to ask you guys, though, for later is pick out any flaws in my, in my arguments, because I want to know if later, Alex. <laughs> 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 It is. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. All right. Okay. Where am I getting? <laughs> Time. Um, they uh, two methods for processing pigments: um, a chloride process, which can use Chinese domestic ilmenite, and a sulfate process, which cannot use their local ilmenite. Uh, Kenmez ilmenite can be used for the sulfate process. Uh, the Chinese government's trying to encourage people to use the sulfate process because it's better for environmental reasons, and this increases the demand for their ilmenite rather than the local stuff. Um, and European pigment smelters, um, who are converting this into the pigment, they 
transfer to the sulfate process where the energy prices went up. So they uh, switched to this process um, and shut down their chloride process plants. Um, just when the energy prices went up last year, and that should flip around. Um, Stainless metal, 5% of that is used uh, for, to make metals um, in aircraft. More recent aircraft are using more, more titanium because uh, it's better for fuel efficiency, but it is more expensive than steel. Um, titanium is listed as a critical mineral in several countries. Uh, a lot of this supply does come from Russia and Ukraine, and that's been cut off. Um, our Airbus didn't want to have sanctions against their, uh, their Ilmenite supply because it would harm the aerospace industry across Europe, apparently. Um, the largest titanium producer is a Russian firm. We used to supply Airbus and Boeing, and they've both switched away now. Uh, the aircraft industry is set to grow almost 3%, and to demand for titanium should be uh, set to grow for a 6% CAGR over the next few years. So there is demand growth scheduled. The Russians obviously are going to keep all their stuff because they want to keep it for weapons while this war goes on. Titanium metals uh, market is 12% of their feedstock sales. So zircon is the other thing that's used for tiling that they get up the ground. Um, uh, it's used in ceramics, um, foundries and refractories, so that's uh, anything that needs high temperatures and uh, chemicals as well. Again, it's affected by high energy costs and um, they are, they are um, Kemmer is now seeing increased demand from India and Latin America as well as uh, Europe and China because they're growing. And it's also on the critical minerals list. And it's Kemmer is the largest, fifth largest supplier of Zircon, provides 5% of global supply. That's how much they make of each bit. So ilmenite and rutile uh, are used for pigments. Zircon is used for tiling. And they make this other stuff, the concentrates, which you might find interesting. The concentrates are used to be processed into rare earth minerals. And obviously, EV demand, wind turbines, they used to make magnets. Um, they Canmare didn't used to develop this stuff, um, but now they are doing. Uh, they've got a bit of it that they, I don't think they had a step stockpile, but they've now developed a way of, of separating it out. It's only 7% of their revenue, but this might increase. Um, the revenue split. You can see uh, their major customers, about 50% of their, their uh, revenue for four big customers. Uh, you can see the splits of where they're shipping it to around the world. So China is big, but it's not as big as it was. Um, you've seen these. Um, net income and free cash flow. In 2018, they moved one of their plants from to one of the... Uh, concentrated plants from one area to another. And there was a lot of capex spent for that. So they uh, had a drop there. And obviously in 2020, they were still moving it. But the comeback from that has been pretty uh, significant. It's on a, if you take a five year average, it's on a low multiple, I think, and a 10% free cash flow yield on average uh, is pretty good, I think. They are paying out lots of divs. It's 12% dividend yield today, 25% in net profit, and they want to pay out between 20 and 40% of uh, after tax income of dividends. Um, that's their target. Now, that obviously depends on what, how much they can produce, and but 20% is a minimum is what they're saying for 2023. Now, they are headquartered in Ireland, so on a listed on the um, Dublin Euronext Exchange, as well as the but see, managed uh, exchange, so there's 25% holding tax if you're holding in the UK, which brings it down to probably 1.9%, something like that. Um, oh, and they've also done a buyback offer uh, by a tender, and uh, that was actually pumping up. It's 5.9% of capital. They bought back 18% of shares in the last couple of years. They did have an, an issuance of shares in 2015-16 to clear some debt. But they haven't issued any more shares since then, and they're now starting to bring that down, which I think is good. They've got a bit of debt, um, not that much, I don't think. Um, it's some of it is secured against the mine assets, and they're all within their covenants, so I haven't got any worries about those. 
Um, they've got plenty of debt facilities available, but they seem to manage their cash uh, debt requirements quite well. Barclays are the main banker, and they do factor some of their receivables. So we know what that means, yeah? Factoring, yeah, okay, so basically they get, they pay out and they get their, their receivables up front. Um, they pay a fee for that so they can have uh, cash flow. And it's, I think it's all right. Some people do that when they can't, when they really can't manage their cash very well, but they seem to have done it quite effectively and I'm not particularly worried about that. We've lost the bottom of the screen. So um, cost of capital, 11%. Return on invested capital at the moment is 22%. So I think that's okay. They pay royalties to Mozambique government, 29 and a half million in 2022. Um, now this is interesting for tax reasons. I actually looked up, I found a report online that was talking about trying to be negative about them and talking about the, you know, the harm that miners do to communities and, and uh, the countries. And interestingly, they couldn't really say anything bad about what it had done to the local communities because it's quite good with the local communities. Um, but what they did pick up on, which I thought was interesting, was their, their tax, the way they pay tax. They'd seen this as a negative, and as investors, we'd probably see this as a positive. They have two companies operating the mining and the processing divisions, and they're both incorporated in Mauritius, and they pay the money out to a Jersey subsidiary. Um, they are taxed in Mozambique at 32%, but the processing uh, facility, which you saw before, that big building, is based in an industrial free zone. So they don't actually pay any corporate taxes except for 1% on revenue after the first six years of production. So they've been in that for a while, so they're all good. Yeah, but 1% on that, and they, um, the exploration and extraction activities, which the mine does, they're not kind of classed as industrial free zone activities. So they've separated out and this out into two companies, which I think is quite clever, really. Um, they're not evading tax, they're just avoiding it. Uh, could be a risk if Mozambique comes along and says, hey, well, we're not getting our fair share. That, that is potentially a risk, I think. So they're planning to do a big capex uh, spend in the next few years. They're going to move part one of these plants uh, to a different area called Nataka. Um, this is how they're going to do it. The last time they moved their plant, they just put it on a on a a road going vessel and they moved it up the road. Here what they're going to do is they're going to actually mine a path to this area which is supposedly the best grade material in the mine that they've checked out and the way they're going to do it is they're just going to dredge and mine up. Now on the way it's going to be a low um, a low return mine path but once they get there it's going to be really good. That's what they reckon. So take a total cost of 288 million to get up there, um, it takes three years of cap expend and a bit of an over a tail of extra expenses. The last time they did this move, I had a look at 2019, 2018, and 2019. They brought it in on time and on budget, um, and they've already got the equipment ready for the move because they want to lock in their cost, which I think is quite clever, really. Uh, and they might be able to pick up some of the slack from their second biggest plant, which is. Um, Concentrate plant B yeah. and with the short haul. Uh, and they're also going to move that plant up to this high high yield area uh, later on soon as well. So uh management, how am I doing for time? Am I all right? Uh you're gonna kill me. You're going a bit over. You're right, you it's all right, four, not too much. Four, 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 five five minutes. Minutes. We'll give also the same time to our oh, other speaker. Well, let's go back, right? <laughs> yeah. Fair. Uh, management are pretty good, actually. They've got a good balance of finance guys and um, engineering guys. So the CEO has got a background in engineering on the ground. He's not just a numbers guy. The finance guy is the chairman. He's only been in recently. Um, chart accountant in the CFO position, but he's got background in mining. The other six non-execs, three with engineering backgrounds and three with finance backgrounds, one with the ex-CEO of the Irish Stock Exchange, where they're listed, so that might be uh, useful. Um, and uh, they've got, one of the guys has got uh, experience with mine sands dredging operations in Brazil as well. So uh, I think they've got a good 
set of expertise rather than, you know, when you see these companies, it's just a load of bankers and, you know, ex-management consultants, someone who's not always convinced. Uh, and the other execs all have roles in mining, uh, experience in mining and in working in Mozambique as well. Uh, I always look at how much salaries range uh, in terms of as a percentage of operating income, because that's what we're paying out as shareholders to get their skills. Um, and this is on a par with their major competitors. One and a half percent of operating income. I don't know if you guys think that's fair or is that... Have you guys looked at this at all? Do you guys look at management costs? Yeah, do you think it's fair or no? A yeah, a bit high. You think it's a bit high. Okay, maybe, maybe I should reconsider that then. What would you say is, you say a bit less on operating income? What do you think? Own a lot of stock, right? Well, um, the CEO owns about, um, yeah, just under 1% of the company. So uh, I don't know if that's enough. But yeah, okay. ESG, I don't want to talk too much about ESG. I'll just talk about the S. They're providing schools. They've got some schools. Uh, they're providing scholarship. They're electrifying the villages and town nearby. Um, they seem to have a pretty good relationship with the community, which I quite like. I don't think there's any need to be excessive. They make enough profits, uh, and pass a bit of it around and not have any sort of um, people coming in and want to take over your mine or protest against it, I think. They use um, hydroelectric power for 90% of their electricity. There is problems with the electricity supply. Uh, they're going to have to probably spend to sort that out, but just how, how the country is. But they use um, an, uh, an uninterruptible power supply, a UPS system, to make sure that they maintain the power. Uh, and that will cut their diesel usage for the uh, emissions. Uh, clinical situation. One party has been in power since they gained independence from Portugal in 1975. Um, SEPT probably... Uh, do that again. They're having an election cycle now from October this year to October next year. Um, hopefully that won't result in major disruption. Um, their mine is on the south. There has been some civil unrest in the north of the country um, where they've got LNG deposits and uh, that's quite far away from where they are. They're on the coast, they're close to the, uh, their own port and that there are three deep sea ports that they can use to get the stuff out so unless we get into a ukraine type situation uh hopefully that won't happen uh the outlook overall prices are down on 2022 obviously with construction being down in china and being hit uh, around the world but um there is a structural shortfall of the supply of ilmenite um, which means that over the medium long term they're probably going to be okay the pigment producers, now this is interesting, what happens is, I'll talk about the um, competitors a little bit, in a bit. Um, they do cut back production, so the pigment producers who they give their uh, supply to, um, they will cut back and make sure that there isn't too much demand, so uh, too much supply rather, so they can match it with demand so that um, prices don't fall too much. Um, hopefully they can produce at a high volume until the move of their first plant. Um, that will help uh, keep them paying out dividends. And if you think about it, they've paid out quite a lot of money in dividends in the last few years and then carry on doing that. At such a low price, you get your money, well, part of your money back, and then there's a risk um, of them not producing that anymore. But uh, hopefully that'll be all right. Now, these are the competitors. Rio Tinto, we all know. Yeah, um, they're... It's, it's a, their Ilmenite production is about 5% of their revenue. It's not a massive amount. Um, their biggest competitors, I've looked at Tronox and Iluca. Um, Tronox were a spin out from another company. I can't remember the name of the company, actually. They were a spin out from a company which had um, polluted Anadarko. You guys know about Anadarko? There was a, um, they polluted a lot of um, Native American lands in. Uh, uh, states and the um, products were spun out to kind of maintain those uh, costs, litigation costs separately. Now they complained about this and sued the original company and have reached an agreement with the US government for compensation of five billion to be covered. Now I still think that I don't want to get involved in a company that's got that kind of background 
Um, they've got high amount of debt, uh, debt to equities, you know, pretty much level. So um, I wouldn't want to go there. Uh, Luca is more interesting. Oh, the other thing about Tronox is they don't really, they don't compete in the same market. So what they do is they take their um, produce and they convert it into titanium dioxide. So they're trying to take a different section of the market. And I just want, I like the simplicity of Kenmare's business. It's just simple. It seems like their margins are lower, uh, Tronox is. So they actually don't make as much money relatively because the actual, what they're competing against, they're competing against uh, the Chinese pigment juices in terms of uh, cost and in terms of putting their stuff out there. And uh, it's not an area I think I'm comfortable with. Galuca seems more interesting. They operate in Australia. So their, their, um, their bottom line is, is less because the tax is higher. In Australia, but they have a pretty good uh, level of production. Actually, they produce more rutile and synthetic rutile, which is their big thing. Um, let me just bear with me a second. Now, an interesting thing I want to say about um, Iluca is they actually do signal what they're producing. So I don't know if you guys know that the memory chip market they signal each other. Um, in terms of what they're going to put out. So SK Hynix will say, oh, we're going to produce this much memory and um, Micron can also announce how much they're going to produce or how much they're going to pump back supply in order to balance demand and long-term prices. And it seems to me like the pigment guys do the same thing. So, for example, Iluka said in their last quarterly, they said, we will pause production at SR1, which is one of their plants, from Q4, along with maintenance at SR2, in order to match production with demand and reduce inventory. And they're putting that out in their, in their reports. So, and they also say they're going to restart in January 2024. So they're saying, we're going to stop from now, we're going to restart this time. So their competitors, they can also uh, limit their, their supply and that keeps the prices high. So prices have dropped a bit, the produce, um, but not as much as you'd expect. So retail prices have dropped about 10%. Uh, Ilmanac prices have dropped about 50% from last year. Um, uh, but I think the, the overall demand picture looks quite good uh, on the long term. So basically, I'm coming to the end. This is why I like it, and this is why I dislike it. So on the plus side, they're simple business, 100-year mine life, 20 years of visibility, so they've got reserves of 20 years that they can prove, and resources, which are the, if we uh, would think we've got up to 100 years. Um, they're the sole provider, uh, sole, they've got sole rights over this mine. Um, there's low risk of product disruption, that's it basically. They, they, there's no alternative for pigments uh, at the moment. Now, something can come along, but I think it's less of a risk than a high-tech business where someone might come along and screw with NVIDIA because their chips are unavailable and you know, Google are doing it, Amazon are doing it. Everyone's trying to make chips now. So that's not going to happen. You're dealing with the same product. But the risk is, but because of that, you you have to be a price taker. It's a commodity. Um, and you're in a cyclical business. So they seem to have good management, balance sheets wrong, good capital controls. They're going to need some capex spend, um, but as we saw with the last time they did that, the amount of money they're making since that point and the amount of money we're returning to shareholders is pretty good, I think. So uh, yeah, that's that's the uh, company. They've uh, the risk is the resources could be overstated, but I can see twenty years out looks good, um, and uh, they're not trying to do anything else. They're not planning to diversify or take on other businesses. They're very very simple. Uh, for someone like me, I like simple. It's easy to understand. So uh, that's it. That's all I've got to say about it. So uh, would you like to do a question now, or is you do? Let's do one? just one, one, two questions. So a bit. Of... Great, one, uh, one, two questions, uh, and we'll have, and then we'll, we can we can have more later. Okay. So if you have something to to ask.
Yeah, we have this uh, as well. Right, so. Set down a bit closer, please. Yeah. And I speak to you all with her, with the cable, okay? Yeah, I just, I quickly checked on um, the subject for uh, coming, oh, and I was wondering uh, what drove the, the stock crash around 2015, if you looked uh, at that, because the price dropped a lot uh, from like about a minute. Like yes, sense. they did. Yeah, they dropped a lot. Now a lot of um, a lot of uh, I think the price went down a lot. The their products, they um, also had a lot of debt um, at that time. And I looked at that period. That just if you look at um, energy producers, for example, 2015, 2016, yeah. everything dropped like a lot. Like yeah. if you look at FCX, um, Freeport, uh, their price. Dropped. If you look at um, Equinor oil and gas, you know you can see that 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 period was was that. So I think that's that's what it was. They've recovered from that quite well, yeah. I think. Um, but they did issue stock at that time, uh, and they took on about two hundred and fifty million two hundred fifty million in capital. Right. I'm hoping that won't have to happen again. That is a risk. Yeah. Do you feel that that's uh, well, no, it's just because uh, uh, I got crushed by <laughs> some crashes due to some uh, you know, cheap stocks that I could find on the London Stock Exchange that yeah. were either Ukrainian or Dutchman, I got frozen because I was attracted by the low ratios and things like that. So now when it's in another country, I'm more okay. skeptical about my capacity into analyzing those country risks and things yeah. like that. <laughs> That's why it's... Up and, down on the list. Yeah, and so that's why it's sometimes if it's listed right. in the UK, yeah. uh, as you mentioned, it's listed in Jersey, and uh, yeah. then like all the activity of the business yeah. um, is um, is dependent on the foreign completely um, um, foreign countries, yeah. foreign um, uh, currency, and we don't know. I mean, I have no idea about the political situation in Mozambique, but. As we see a lot of currency also having a lot of inflation, what are, how is the Mozambique currency doing uh, with inflation, things like that. Good point. Have to look at that. So I will. Just have a look. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 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 You cannot call me like cool. I'm not waiting for you to try. I think at the end we will have more discussion. Okay, from so keep your questions. <laughs> That's a fact that which are really good, really interesting. And just a really simple question: Have you tried to value the compass at all? And, and if so, do you uh, you have a number on you know the potential upside? Or is it just obviously you're sitting there, it's cheap for the airports, it's good at your own. For me, well, I, I mean, I'll just, I mean how, how can you value it? It depends how you want to value it. So if you want to value it by multiples or based on, um, you know, wave that. So if you want to base it on uh, the, the earnings, mm -hmm. uh, you can look at the last five years and they can say it's, you know, a five year five year average multiple. If they could pull that off, then you're on a, a five X. So it depends where you want to go and what you think is normalized. So I think normalized would be in terms of you know, you can double it on the price, that would be fair. So the way I'm looking at this is because it's got it's a long line life, but if there isn't political risk can necessarily, then it's something that I can just hold. If it's just gonna pay out and produce these kind of returns, because what look what I'm looking for is a High average return on cap investing capital. Now they're all investing a lot of money, but if this can continue for a long time, then I think I, I just hold it. But if you want to look at on a cheapness basis, just if it doubles, then get out. I think yeah. that's because it's the, the reason I came to this stock is was it showing up on some of my screens, which are automated screens. So I'll buy them cheap and then I'll sell them after a year or two years. And uh, basically, those are they're just bought cheap, and they it's a waste. Wait for a re rating. It's the old way of style. Wait for it to re rate, and if it doesn't re rate, then just sell it. Um, so that's where this is, and I found it on there. Um, I'm probably quite high in this uh, in terms of my percentage portfolio, probably pushing 15% at the moment. Some of that's going to come off, 
within the next year because it's got my automated rolling. I'm looking to probably maintain five to ten percent. Now that might be a bit high, a bit scary. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. We will we'll have to go to the next one, but at the end we will get more. Okay? Yeah. All the staff wanted to thank the media to City Park for giving this opportunity. Um, I've sat on the other side of this many times, and so to be able to speak here, it's, it's a real honor. Wait, if it doesn't work, now it should. Does it? Yeah. Not good. Yeah. Do you want to say a few things for, for your health? I can say a few things if you want. So, oh, okay. okay, I mean, like I know, I know Wade, and I know that uh, he's uh, he, you, you have been uh, investing for you have been investing for one two years now, right? But you he, he has very good returns so so far, and uh, he's really right. Yeah. So yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words. Um, so maybe before um, the company I want to talk to you guys today about is uh, CNX Resources. Maybe before we start, just a little bit, bit about myself. I did my bachelor's at UCL in philosophy economics in 2019. Worked for three years as a private FC valuation analyst. During which time I got my CFA charter. After getting the I will learn and doing a master's at LSE in finance and private equity. And it was really at LSE when my value investing journey started. A very heavy involved LSE Value Investing Society. And we would uh, meet up weekly to discuss different stocks. We got to speak with some amazing value investors, the likes of uh, Nick Sleep, Manish Pabai, and uh, Rob Benno. Um, and in the second term, we end, actually have ended up teaching a, a term week course on how to do fundamental analysis of stock. It was during this time that I launched my own investment portfolio, just because we were going through so many stocks. And then I kind of wanted to see if I could put all good. <laughs> I want to see if I could put uh, money where my mouth is, basically. And uh, since so we launched it in uh, 30th of Jan, that was when we made our first investment. And uh, yesterday, the year, I'm glad to say we just uh, this was last Friday, we reached 114 percent. <laughs> uh, now I'm talking a little bit about investment philosophy, and it's not lost on me the arrogance of someone with less than one years of investment experience coming here with a lot of people that are long experience to talk about my investment philosophy. Um, but it's just three simple points that have really helped me with my mindset, and it applies to the company I want to talk about today. First one that I try to focus on is always take care of the downside, and the upside of take care of so. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit small, but I'll quickly go through, you know, a lot of, um, it's very common for a lot of us to say this. Uh, rule number one, uh, don't lose money. Rule number two, don't forget rule number one, Warren Buffett. Um, minimizing the downside risk while mass maximizing the upside is a powerful concept. Manish Prabhai also came up with the famous phrase, you know, heads I win, tails I don't lose much. And, uh, you know, an important thing to remember about investing is that it's not sufficient to set up a portfolio that will survive on average. The key is survive the low ends, the common ones. Um, and then, so, I want to quickly talk about what, what I mean by this, really. And it's, it's the mindset of when you're, the, you're focused on not losing money, right? Um, before I started value investing, I was uh, trading commodities for a little bit. And then at that time, I was really looking towards like where I can make money from. And then when you do that, I found that I invited a lot of biases into my analysis. Uh, probably among the famous, he said that the easiest person to pull is yourself. Um, and so when you want to make money, you tend to pull yourself in a lot of different ways. So when you when you focus on not losing money, you know, um, it really can help prevent a lot of that. And the other thing I want to talk about this is the opportunity cost, right? As investors, we're constantly going over opportunity cost, different opportunities. 
Um, but at the end of the day, the main thing I'm comparing to opportunity cost of any investment is just letting the cash sit because at the end of the day, that's, that's the worst case scenario. Um, so when you compare it to that, you know, you'll, you not, you should only really invest when you think that you're not going to lose a lot of money. Second thing, keep it simple. There's a lot of people who came to investors. Again, that's a lot of, uh, wisdom on this. Um, again, another Charlie Munger quote, can't think of a single example in my whole life where keeping it simple has worked against us. We made mistakes, but they weren't because we kept it simple. Um, there's a few others. Um, I'm not going to do all of them. Um, but again, you know, I think there's so many unpredictable variables in the world that, um, that you can't really accurately predict what's going to happen in the future. Um, that's not to say you shouldn't have these valuation models or like forecast, but it's just how you weight them, right? Um, and it's something that we said a lot during the value, uh, in the value society was, uh, it's always better to be roughly right than precisely wrong. We're big believe in that. Last thing is just keep an open mind and stay flexible. You know, um, when I first started, the thing that I would hear a lot is, uh, you know, stay within your circle of competence. But when I first started, I wasn't competent in anything. So that kind of just closed the entire universe off. Uh, so what I realized was, you know, competence is really, it's a, it's a spectrum, right? It's dynamic. And then, so when I was starting from zero, what it gave me the opportunity was every industry was a new industry. So I, it kept me open to a lot of opportunities because it was just learning about them. And, um, uh, Yes. And so there's a few quotes that I really like. One fact change actually in my mind, teens. And uh, on, this, on this topic, there's a great book called Where the Money Is, which we were talking about this earlier, where he talks about how value investing has really changed from bank growing days and net nets to Buffett's uh, quality compounding over the long term. And now, right now, over the last decades, two decades, or we're in the digital age. Um, I think the world is constantly changing. And then us as value investors that are really investing for the long term, we have to learn how to change with it. So with that in mind, and so I hope that will be too narcissistic, but um, I, hopefully I'll show you the company I want to talk about today covers all the points. So coming out, I'll talk about CNX. Before I start, I do want to give credit to James Wilson, who is the fund manager of the Huden Fund of Phoenix Asset Management. Uh, it was, I heard this, him giving this pitch at uh, the London Value Investment Conference this year, and it was him that really inspired me to look towards this direction and big inspiration for the pitch. So before I start, I really want to talk about one of the major preconceptions that I had before going into this, which was carbon fuels or fossil fuels are basically uninvestable, right? You have, you know, so climate's getting signal faster, we've been feeling it, although it's actually been quite nice in the UK to get out of summers, um, but it's an increasingly pressing issue globally. You've got, like, increasingly world governments coming together to talk about, uh, to focus on climate change, um, how to tackle it. And you're hearing more and more these terms of clean energy transition, net zero, more and more. And what this actually means is, well, this is uh, what I want to talk about. Essentially, uh, you see the gap, the, the lighter green, the lighter blue, sorry, is an investment, global investment in clean energy. The darker blue is a fossil fuel. Uh, first thing I want to note is that invest, global investment in clean energy has now surpassed fossil fuels. And the second thing I want to note is that that gap is increasing. And but what sorry, uh, yes. Uh, uh, so what does this mean for uh, investors, right? And so this is a, a ten year uh, history of uh, the S and P five hundred market versus the S and P five hundred oil and gas. You can see there is uh, oil and gas is massive in the um, At this point, you might be thinking, why am I going with this? <laughs> Everything has been pretty negative. Um, but this is where the staying flexible kind of comes in, where it's like, uh, 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 before going into this, I really was very negative towards what skills as well, but thinking a bit, big deep, a bit deeper, uh, I feel like picture's not as black and white. So when we look at the problem of uh, climate change, the main thing is carbon emissions, right? And then when you look at carbon emissions, you look at the three main culprits, coal, oil, gas. And because of this, it's very easy to lump them all together. You know, they're all non-renewable, they're all polluting. And then collectively you label that as bad and something that we need to move away from. When we take a closer look, you see it, that you start to see there's some nuances. Firstly, our natural gas is significantly more, uh, more, more than double as uh, carbon efficient than uh, oil and gas. Then on the chart on the right is the grams of CO2 emitted per kilowatt of, uh, kilowatt hour of energy produced. Um, you see, it's uh, about less than half, or more than double as efficient. Um, 
this is the uh, wall share of uh, electricity, produ uh, electricity production by source. The focus on OECD just because these typically uh, these countries have a lot more flexibility in terms of the energy sources they do use and the amount of money they can invest in different energy infrastructure. And you see over the last about, I want to go from 20, 2000s, right, it's been a steady decline in coal and uh, an increase in gas, wind and solar. And the, on the right, I want to show uh, a graph of the US where it's essentially the same, but the, this drop off in coal is a lot steeper and the increase in gas is a lot steeper as well. And the main reason for this is just because of the amount of natural gas resources that was discovered or being able to extract over the last 10 years since the fracking revolution. Um, so, so the question really is, so we see this trend now, but the question really is, will this trend continue, right? Um, re realistically, coal is going to continue decreasing just because uh, as a form, it's more expensive than gas and it's more polluting. So there's no reason to, at least in the in developed, more developed countries. Um, but the question is, will gas take over the coal drop or will it be renewables? And eventually, will it be renewables taking up gas's market share? And to answer this question, which is a quickly, I want to go over some of the, the main end uses for uh, natural gas in the U US. It's roughly split a third into industrials, a third into residential commercial, essentially buildings and heating, and the last is a third of uh, is into uh, electrical electrical power generation. So for industrial, natural gas plays a very key role in uh, in producing ammonium nitrate, which is a very key component in nitrogen fertilizers. Um, this is something that the the president of the fertilizer industry said. An abundant and affordable supply of natural gas is critical to the fertilizer industry and our ability to provide essential crop nutrients to farmers. Natural gas, natural gas is the primary feedstock for ammonia, the building block for all nitrogen fertilizers, and accounts for 70 to 90 percent of production costs. And just to get a scale of how important nitrogen fertilizers are for the world in general, this is a study done by the uh, old in data and shows about roughly half of our current population is sourced by nitrogen fertilizers. So it has a very um, important role to play. And uh, it's not on here, but something I should mention is I, the IEA did a study on uh, how the world can transition to a low carbon uh, alternative for uh, industrial chemicals, which is what this is. Um, and in all the scenarios, not a single one mentioned, uh, predicted the decline in natural gas. So natural gas is an important part of industrial and it's going to hit stay. The other thing that natural gas is used for industrial is process heat. Um, so like uh, the high temperatures of heating melting of metals for steel, iron, etc. Um, but because of the, the high temperature requirements, there is really, really isn't an alternative that we really have nowadays. Something from the Center on Global Energy Policy said, few options exist today to reasonably substitute low carbon heat sources. Unlike the power sector and light duty vehicles, the operational requirements of temperature, quality, flux and high capacity by stringent uh, constraints on viable options. So it seems like industry, industry in the, from, at least from an industrial standpoint, natural gas is going uh, to continue. The buildings, you know, the US is heavily dependent on natural gas in its buildings, accounts for 42% of US residential energy consumption and 24% of the commercial sector. This is what they're used for, it's not very clear the fact. Um, but it's mainly space heating, essentially. Um, and uh, there is, uh, globally, people are saying that we would we definitely need to move away from natural gas as a heating element if we're going to reach the low carbon emission goals that we have right now. Um, and the UK has been actually very sort of pioneer in, in, in this in this area with the natural ga uh, with the gas boiler ban. Uh, I think it was between 2025 and 2035, I'm not really sure where it's going to happen yet. Um, but when you look close, close at it, it really is, that there's very few really viable options for, to replace natural gas, especially in the US. The main one, it's a picture, but those are heat pumps. The, you might be hearing more and more about them, more people getting them now. Um, these are essentially like, they operate kind of like a refrigerator or an AC, where it's like they use electricity to essentially transfer existing heat into, cool, into different places, whereas it's not actually a source of heat itself. But there's two uh, main, is main issues with this. First, it's not economically competitive at the moment. Uh, study by the CGEP, the same uh, thing I was talking about earlier. 
to heat pumps could compete with gas for new construction in the United States by the 2030s, assuming further cost reductions and a commitment to decarbonization. What I mean by that is they based on current trends of how technology is improving and how carbon pricing is increasing, roughly around 2030, that they will be able to compete. Um, but even if they do, are, are able to compete eventually, the problem is this is not solving the problem. You're just having another source of energy to power this, which is electricity. And it's actually a significant amount of electricity. A study by the IA said if all heat heating in all buildings in Europe was switched to elect electricity using heat pumps, peak winter electricity demand would increase by more than 60%. And this peak capacity is something that the currently grid, natural grids in the US and Europe, they don't have the capacity to do this right now, so there will be, have to be significant investment in this, which is another resistance point. And also, if it was electricity demand increased, then there will be some more offset the decrease in natural gas, because natural gas helps electricity production. <laughs> Last thing, uh, electricity production price for the environment. Um, this is the same thing you saw earlier. This is the, the decrease. Um, so gas is roughly about 40% of electric, electricity production in the U US, coal is about 20, nuclear is about 20, and then renewable can about coming in the Um The question really, when, when I'm thinking about what's going to be the future at the main energy source, it's really a cosmetic analysis between price, and within price you, you have availability, you know, you have feed, uh, technology, technological development. Um, all that is really a function of price, and then the economical damage, uh, the environmental damage of each of the fuel sources. And then to get a better picture of this, this is the levelized cost of energy by, by technology. Um, and then just, it's not, I'm not done it out here, but it's not very clear. So uh, the majority of renewable energy is between 0 0.5 for 5 cents to about uh, 8 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, natural gas, historically in the US, has ranged between 4 cents and 6 cents. So it's on the very low end of this range. So you have in the US a large amount of uh, natural uh, natural gas, and you have a very cheap source of natural gas, and you have a very uh, little, relatively low carbon form uh, of energy. And call me a skeptic, but I don't think it, uh, any country, but especially the US, given their history with uh, with energy, uh, they're going to leave that amount of energy source just in the ground. Right. So. Hopefully, I've shown you that you know, uh, not all just because uh, not all fossil fuels are bad, or at least not all fossil fuels are going to go away immediately. Coal, yes, probably in the very short term, we're, we're actively trying to phase this away. Oil, we've not really covered as many a transport fuel, um, but you know, with the rise of EVs, um, I think it's slowly going. We'll wait to see if you know if they can electric vehicles can really take over the heavy vehicle uh, market as well. And uh, for natural gas, I hope I've shown that. They really do have a place in at least within the next 20 to 30 years of society. With that in mind, I want to talk about CNX. Sorry, that was a lot of, <laughs> of facts. Uh, CNX is a natural gas e uh, exploration and uh, production company with midstream assets and based in the Appalachian region. Uh, this was, I think, as of yesterday, but their market cap is about 3.35 billion, enterprise value of 5.67. Uh, they were originally the gas division of uh, Console Energy, uh, diversified energy producers since the 1860s. Um, roughly around the start of the last decade, around 2010s, uh, they started shifting a lot of their focus towards natural gas. This coincided with the rise of fracking in the US. Uh, and around 2017, they split the two companies in order to essentially uh, console uh, into two public companies. And console were left with all the coal assets, and then TNX were left with all the uh, natural gas assets. And of this asset that they got from natural gas, it included 531 net acres of Marcellus shale and 346 of Utah shale which collectively is the Appalachian region. This will become important shortly. Uh, they also got 2 million acres of coal bed methane and 1 million of other shale acres, which will also become important. And then at the bottom is the stock share price. Sorry, it's a, it's a 20. Um, so the first reason why I really like CNX is they are in the prime location to be for natural gas. And uh, I want to talk, talk about to first about why the Appalachian Basin is the best place. First is the amount of natural gas resources they have the largest reserves in the country. This is the 2021 proof shale reserves of the six or seven major basins in the US. You can see they're more than double the next big biggest, which is the Permian Basin, Texas. The second reason is the quality of natural gas resources. The, the Appalachian Basin primarily consists of dry shale gas, which uh, requires a lot less uh, processing to get to end market uses than uh, wet gas that you see in a lot of the other basins. 
And the last thing, which is my favorite fact, is their proximity and markets. So this is a map, I don't know if you can see very clearly, of all the largest natural gas basins within the US. Um, the Appalachian Basin is the only one really on the East Coast. And one of the biggest costs associated with natural gas is the transport cost because it is very difficult to transport. And then so they, around next to them, they have New York, Pennsylvania, Boston, Boston, uh, Washington. So they have a lot of major cities on, on the East Coast that, that, are, that are very dependent on the Appalachian Basin. And what this means in terms of actual production is you see the Appalachian Basin is the largest producer of natural gas. The, the top green one, it's, you can't see that at all, but the top green one is Marcella, Celis, and then the, this one in red is the Utica. Um, to combine them, they account for around uh, 40, I think 40 BCFs per day, which is about, oh, that's a lot. <laughs> um, uh, and then the other reason is they are, uh, the actual quality of uh, the acreage in, within the Appalachian Basin is very high. So this is a study on the new well, uh, the amount of gas that you can produce from each new well drill. So Appalachian Basin is more than double, uh, maybe slightly less, but almost double uh, the next most efficient uh, basin. And then this is a metric of basically when you drill a new well, how many uh, MTS or million, million metric cubic feet of gas can you produce per day. And then so summary of why Appalachian Basin is, is a great place to be. They're the largest resource basin for natural gas, they're the largest producer for natural gas, and also the cheapest users for natural gas. We've got high efficiency, which is this uh, production efficiency, lower processing costs due to the dry, uh, dry shale gas, and low transport costs due to their proximity to the East Coast, or major US markets. Next, I want to talk about CNX specifically and their asset base. So this is a map of the Marcellus and Utica region. Uh, I just want to divert your attention to one thing here, which is this like right angle line here and here. Um, for those that, well, I'm not really good at US geography either, but on the left of this is Ohio, on the right of this is Pennsylvania, and on the bottom is West Virginia. That line is gonna be very important. Um, and so the darker regions are where all the, uh, or I guess the most asset rich areas are. Um, and just keep in note that, so on both these areas, the asset rich areas are just on the right of this right angle. And this is CNX's shale acreage. Again, you see that right angle line, and then you see the majority of the asset. They have a great concentration of assets right where the shale hotspots are. And I tried to be smart and did an overlap, uh, but the colors are kind of matching, so you can't really see, but hopefully you get the picture. These are the two pictures overlapped. You see that the shale acreage overlaps a lot with the shale hotspots in the region. And they've been, and they, because of this, they've been able to thrive uh, in terms of their production costs. They are, this is their all-in production uh, cash costs. And uh, so the blue is their production cash costs. And then the gray added on is their fully burdened cash costs. They've long prided themselves as being the low cost producer in the basin. And this is something that management said about three years ago, but it's still the case today. This is for 20, uh, last 12 months. Um, but their, uh, their fully burdened cash costs is cheaper than all their pe peers' is, uh, production and cost. These are four peers that are primarily based in the population region, or primarily located in the population region as well. Um, but why are they able to do this, right? The main reason why is because of their mission assets. In 2020, they acquired their own, well, it used to be CNX mystery business, but they fully acquired it in 2020. And as part of that, they got 2,600 miles of natural gas gathering pipelines and a number of natural gas processing facilities. And what's more than this is a lot of these ga uh, natural gas pipelines were right around the shale hotspots that we mentioned earlier. And is that uh, around the shale hotspots, there's also major gas pipelines that deliver to the East Coast or the major markets. So they really have very little transportation and gathering costs. And as well, also processing, uh, processing facilities. And what this results in is significantly lower transportation, gathering, or processing costs per uh, MCFT use. Their peers who do not have this midstream assets are a lot more dependent on third parties for this for the service. And then the service is then uh, essentially a function of uh, inflation, of gas prices. So they have a lot less control over this. Um, yes. Sorry. Yes. And then so the first part of my thesis is I hope I've shown you that they're the, they're the lowest cost basin. They have a prime acreage position in the lowest cost basin. They have significant, significant mystery assets, making them the lowest cost producer within the basin, making them the lowest cost producer in the lowest cost basin, which for a commodity-based business is a great competitive advantage to have. 
Next, I'm going to show you why this leads to strong and consistent free cash flow generation. So the lowest cost base allows for a very aggressive hedging. This is the historic Henry Hub gas, natural gas spot price. So I'm going to show you this is the normal range between $2 and $4. And it's kind of always the less. And then CNX's uh, cost base is around $1.25, as I showed you earlier. And then so because of this, because the cost base is below the especially lower bound of the normal range, they're able to aggressively hedge the following, knowing that they still remain profitable. This is the CNX hedge versus their peers. You see, they, they've hedged about 75% of their production. This was at the end of FY22. This was the yeah, end of FY22, their hedges to FY23. Um, their peers have high costs, are not able to hedge as much because they have to be a lot more opportunistic, hoping that if gas prices rise, that they will be able to spend it off that in order to ensure because if they hedge everything, then they just they know they just wouldn't be profitable. And the other thing is because uh, they not only hedge aggressively, but they hedge very long into the future. So this is a hedge book for the next five years. Um, maybe it's not clear the back, but in, in essentially they have about one, uh, one, 1,650 uh, billion cubic feet of uh, natural gas hedged. Um, so then just for context, they produce roughly around 560 to 580 billion uh, per year. Um, and then to... If if you apply then this, the hedge prices are roughly around two dollars forty to two dollars sixty, um, and then if you apply the cash cost uh, in from that we calculated earlier, then essentially you have for the next five years two point one billion in guaranteed free cash, uh, guaranteed operation operational cash flow. They also have a few two additional uh, free cash flow drivers I want to talk about. The first, their new tech division, which is something that they've really been working on. Uh, they really got online o online this year. Essentially, it's a lot of projects that help with the uh, uh, the clean energy transition. So they do a lot of carbon capture projects and a lot of methane abatement. Mm -hmm. um, and they're very optimistic about this. So yesterday they generated I think nineteen million uh, from free cash flow um, from January to, to now. And in the most recent call, they expected around seventy five. They have very good line of sight. So they're very confident in seventy five million of free cash flow from the new tech division. Going to next year, up range is about 100 million, and then after that, they expect uh, materially more, but they haven't given too much visibility into this. The other thing is their non core asset sales. So, we, we spoke earlier about uh, the amount of acreage they had. This is just a uh, represent representation of it, but it's not clear. But like the green is how much of the proven reserves that they actually used, and then the gray is what they've not used. And essentially, is they only use about 10% of the actual acreage. And what they do with the remaining ninety percent is they like uh, systematically sell them. Essentially, um, I just want to point here. That, you know, uh, something that the the CEO said. We really do have a deep inventory of leases throughout the appellation. We're at the point now where folks come to us a lot to you know, fill in, and, we, and so we're able to monetize some of these non-core asset acreage at pretty attractive prices. Um, all asset sales are valued under very strict criteria and consider the very high. Lots of the come access we to that value. Um, so they have about. Uh, so, like I said, temp, temp, the only reason they have ninety percent of that acreage is currently non-core operational, um, and then so this is essentially like a cash power that they can essentially have a lot of flexibility on. Because if gas prices increase, then they can choose to develop this acreage. If gas prices increase, then they choose not to develop it. They can sell it for higher prices because it's a, it's a more it's a function of the price, right? And if the gas prices decrease, then they can and they're, they're struggling to be profitable, then they can sell it to other peers. We need to increase production in order to, because they are already have higher costs. Um, and then, so this is a, it's, it's not clear at all. I mean, I, I thought it's. Um, so this is uh, just a quick exercise into their free cash flow. I mean, uh, th there's lots of different scenarios, and I didn't really like. Uh, I said earlier, I don't really like doing uh, focusing too much, placing too much weight on these financial projections. Um, but there's just a few key drivers that I want to highlight. So we have the hedge, the, the uh, cash flows from the hedge uh, portion, which amounts to about 2.1 billion uh, over the next five years. And then you can calculate the, the cash flow from the unhedged portion based on whether you think uh, that's probably going to be $2, $3, $4. This is the uh, three scenarios that I've, I've used. Um, incremental cash flow from the new tech, we said uh, earlier um, how you want to project that forward in terms of how much you want to grow. Um, I, for my bear case, I kept at 75 in, in perpetuity. Um, CapEx, this is the only thing that I really want to talk about. 
Um, so their capex has been higher this year. I think uh, historically they've raised around 500 million a year. Um, and this year they're on a higher range of like 675. This has really been a function of uh, one, inflation, and two, they expanded the operations to 1.5 rigs during the year. Um, so then they historically, they historically only operate one. Um, so, and, and Magma said that they've now are now decreasing and going back down to 1%, uh, one rig. And they expect the capex to be materially lower next year and then around 500 by 2025 onwards. Um, so, and I, I, I've not been as optimistic in the bear case. You know, I, I went from 675 to 650, 65 to 600. Um, again, you can play around the figures. And the last thing is asset sales, which is, uh, uh, I, I use 150 uh, million a year just based. Oh, sorry. The thing I didn't mention about asset sales was. So the re you typically wouldn't include asset sales in your free cash flow just because it is a non recurring expense, uh, non recurring uh, income. Um, but they've been very consistent in the asset sales, and I really do think it is part of the business strategy. So over the last seven years, they've sold one point three billion dollars uh, worth of assets, um, and roughly around two hundred million a year has been pretty consistent. So I, I really do see that as like a, a steady. I I can include it into the free cash flow just because management used it as such. Um, but you do it. Uh, and then based on that, uh, we get the free cash flow. Again, I, I, I don't like to place too much uh, waiting on this, but I just wanted to calculate this because I wanted to see what the worst case scenario was. Right? If you had gas prices remaining at $2 for the next five years, which I see is very unlikely, um, if, you, if their capex remain high, then historics are like the 650 to 600 range. Um, and if the asset sales were lower than, than, than historically, and the new tech didn't develop as they wanted, then they're essentially getting 200 million uh, cash flow per year. But in 2027, that's 250. I think right now they're trading around 10x the free cash flow multiple. If you want to plan that, uh, plan multiple on that, that's about 2.5 billion in the current markup, 2.3. But that is, I just, I just want to say, I think that is a really, I don't, I think that's a very unlikely scenario, but that is in my head the worst case scenario. Just because, oh, one, I don't see gas prices staying that low, two, I don't see capex staying that high. And then just for completeness sake, uh, the valuation, this is the valuation of best peers. Um, you see they're basically in line or below from all the metrics. Um, yeah. So I've shown, now I've shown, uh, they have strong and consistent free cash flow generation from substantial hedge book in the new tech division. Vast uh, acreage reserves, which allows them optionality option, option with asset sales. And now, and this is my favorite part of the company, is what they do with the free cash flow they generate. They allocate it very efficiently uh, using by the best in class management team. Now, I, just want to talk, I think management is something that has, I've always found very tricky. We were, talk, we were teaching this uh, last year at the uh, Value Society, and it was really uh, something that I found. I always like to use the, the first line in the top story, it's Anna Kronika, when she says, you know, all happy families are the same and all unhappy families are unhappy in their own ways. Um, I think with management, it's simply the opposite, right? Uh, I think all bad managers are the same, but all great managers that are great in their own ways. So when we're trying to teach you, we really struggle to find like common traits and uh, what you want in an management team. And when we talk to Rob Bino, you know, he said he, the way that he does it is he screens out for the what left, uh, the extreme left tail. He wants to find like the worst case scenario, the clearly fortunate ones, and then he avoids them. Because anything other, it, it's you don't want to be judging someone. You don't want to judge a book on this cover, as cover, right? But my, the point I wanted to make was, if there ever was an example of a great management team, these guys would be it. Because the chairman is both on like the guy who literally wrote the book on what good management is. Uh, I don't know if you guys read this book. It's a great book on uh, it's studies for eight, uh, eight CEOs and how they've been. They were amazing capital allocators, and there's. I firmly believe uh, him having been a student of this, and he puts his own, I guess, uh, lessons into practice. Um, the other is Nick, the CEO, Nick Delius. Um, Nick's, Nick joined the company after uh, undergrad, uh, after his university, worked for the company for over 30 years, jumped around from multiple different divisions, um, and uh, so he knows the business inside and out. And just to get you a sense of what I mean, and I just want to read this because this is you know, uh, something that uh, the CEO said, what we're looking to do is invest that free cash flow in the right places at the right time to optimize long-term intrinsic value per share of the company. That's what capital allocation and stupid capital allocation means to us. 
We're going to be ruthlessly rational when it comes to making those decisions and not following the map. And following the map. We are not a traditional EMP company. We're not even a traditional energy company. So you're not going to see us focus on solving for production growth. You're not going to see us being interested in being the largest producer in the basin or in the country. And you're not going to see us obsessing over short-term EMP-centric metrics, whether they're performance or financial. You will see us obsessing on that long-term intrinsic value per share of the company. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that, in, in my opinion. <laughs> Uh, and it's not just words, they, they really do do it too. So uh, since Q3, so in the last three years, uh, they repressed 69 million shares, which is about 31%. They reduced their shares by 31% uh, for up to my total of $1.1 billion. Um, and also during this time, they reduced their net debt by about uh, $400 million. And just for some context, so they over this period, they generated around $1.65 in free cash flow, and they spent one point. So 1.5 in either uh, share repurchases or uh, repaying debts. And going forward, they really do have a lot of flexibility in how, how they would a allocate the, oh, sorry. So the other thing I want to mention regarding the debt is uh, they do have a lot of flexibility in, in how they pay back the debt and when they pay back the debt. I think the nearest majority is 2026 and the weighted average life is uh, six years. So then they're not, uh, they don't have to refinance uh, in the immediate term, especially given the current high interest rate environment. That's not like an immediate concern for them. And then, so what this allows for is incredible flexibility. These are four scenarios that um, essentially a matrix of like different scenarios that could occur and what they would do, right? If you, if, if you had high gas prices and high share price, they'd increase drilling activities and increase production. If it was high share price but low gas price, they would uh, use they would use their share price as a way to acquire more businesses and grow that way. If it was a high gas price and a low share price, they would allocate them up the free control back to share buybacks. And if it's a low gas price and a low share price, they focus on debt. Uh, right. So they really do, this is, this is something that the management says, and this is really the playbook that they have followed over the last few years. So no matter, regardless of what happens in the future, I feel like they will uh, allocate the capital in a way that is beneficial for the intrinsic value per share of the company. And so that's, yeah, so, uh, the last four points were the flexibility regarding uh, capital allocation, X amount of the team to allocate it, the proven track record of turning cash to shareholders, and X amount of the team. That's not a typo, I just really like the manager team. Um, that's my I hope uh, from that I I've shown you that, you know, um, that keep in mind that natural gas is an investable market, um, depending on what your view was of natural gas or fossil fuels going coming into this. Hope I've kept it very simple and very straightforward thesis. And hope I've, hopefully I've shown that there is minimal capital downside uh, with this opportunity. Thanks so much. This is my LinkedIn. This is the best way to reach me. If you have any questions or just like to chat, um, more than welcome to. Uh, yeah. And uh, I'll be really not to say I'm seeking track and development. <laughs> um, so if anyone out there is hiring, please you know, let, do let me know. And I'm very interested. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much, guys. So now I guess uh, that was a great presentation. We can, I guess, we can take one two question for for this presentation, but then we can have mixed questions for both presentation or whatever we presented uh, earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, this actually Please come come closer so everybody can get the number. Uh, okay. Uh, this uh, thanks both presentations that this is actually an overlapping question for both presentations which is typically in a commodity centric play you're effectively playing the underlying price of that commodity and then an organization can optimize for that commodity so you have a view on on the underlying value in your case natural gas and titanium where are we in that cycle and what do you think those triggers are for the price to keep rising uh, because, you know, with all these companies, there's the commodity cycle and the cycle. I, I can answer that first. Um, so I briefly mentioned beforehand that uh, before I, I got to value matching, I, I briefly traded commodities for a little bit. Um, so I can assure you, I do not know what's going to happen to natural gas. Um, I think uh, right now, if you just look at the historic standpoint, it is, I think, Henry Hub is around 2.7, 2.8, which is uh, just below mid uh, right of the people. Yeah, that's yeah. the average. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, 21 years, it's been about 2.67. Yeah. 
Um, so then, you know, you, you factor in a lot of, uh, you know, three of the major, largest natural gas producers in the world are the US, Iran, and Russia. And two of them are, or arguably, almost three are within like strong, uh, heavy geopolitical tensions right now. So, um, the way that I saw commodity was, uh, I agree with you, um, that it is a lot of times, it's very heavy linked to the underlying commodity price. And the reason why I like CNX is because they hedge so much of the production that their performance is less so affected by the underlying price. So like I said, around 80% of their uh, production is hedged. So whether gas, so if the gas prices remain low, then it's fine because they've already hedged to the downside. And if gas prices do manage to skyrocket, then, you know, they get to benefit from the 20% of their remaining production. Um, so that, that, that's why, that's exactly why I like CNX and typically I will avoid uh, speculating on, on commodities. I also have a, qu a quick question for you. Um, since in the in the US right now we have increasing uh, oil production and uh, gas comes as a um, byproduct there, were you afraid that increasing oil production in the US and as uh, as fields are mature, so there will be more uh, natural gas as byproduct uh, that might 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 you know become a competitor for this low cost producer. Uh, honestly, I, I've not thought about it from that angle. Uh -huh. uh, that's very interesting. Uh, yeah, I'm not. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if if they are very really low cost producers, probably they, they will do well. But uh, th that's the like like that's um why why uh, gas prices would stay low. But then they will be really competitive, probably to other forms of energy. So yeah, I was just wondering about this, but uh, yeah. So other other questions, other questions. Uh, please please come closer and uh, start to give a to Martin. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, there is uh, two things um, um, that I saw in your presentation that I was wondering about. The first one is uh, why is the yen um, uh, enterprise uh, value is so high compared to the uh, market cap. And uh, we didn't really uh, look into their debt. Yeah. Uh, and the other one is you. Um, um, it would be good also to check uh, like the difference between conventional natural gas and shell uh, gas because they're not um, found in, in the same way. They're not processed the same way. Yeah. And uh, we saw like in in twenty sixteen. Uh, everything that happened with um, uh, shale in the US and how many uh, exploitation, uh, many uh, companies failed because uh, of the high uh, uh, prices for um, uh, all the, the expenditures that they had to provide to um, uh, get sh shale oil and also uh, all the, um, I mean, the, the fact that when they get um, uh, the oil, it only lasts for, I think it's about five or six years and then uh, you don't have uh, any remaining resources. So it would be good also maybe to have a look at that. Uh, or if you, if you looked at it, uh, actually, yeah. if you have uh, more insights on this. Yes, so, so let me just answer the first question regarding the net debt. Just want to bring up the, the valuation slide. So I think the net, the net, the net, the net debt is actually a very manageable amount. Um, if you, it's really just a function of the oil and gas industry, but you see most of the net spent value is significantly higher than the market cap is the net debt. Um, as, as this metric might be more interesting to you, which is leverage, which is the net debt as a portion of this, uh, free, uh, operating cash flow, which is really a measure of like how, I guess, leveraged up there and how dangerous it is, the net debt, um, the debt situation is. Um, you see here, they're essentially in, well, slightly higher than a lot of their peers, but I guess on average, it's, it's not too bad. Um, and like I said earlier, I think the nearest maturity is 2026. They also had like 1.5 uh, billion in a, a, a line that they've not uh, taken drawn down yet. Um, and the average wait is six years. So I don't see any uh, issues with paying back debt. The interest payments, I think, per year is around 150 million. So um, they are able to cover it. It's not, it's not a large amount compared to the cash flows they're generating. Um, so I don't really, uh, I, the, the debt situation hasn't really concerned me and I'm not always uh, focused on reducing the leverage. Um, the second question you asked me was regarding, 
Uh, so yes, uh, everything I've talked about today is uh, regarding shale gas. Um, the company do have uh, I think a very small amount of liquid uh, natural gas production and other natural gas production as well, but the, I think about 90% of the revenue or production come from shale gas and this is where we got their focus at. Um, in regards to like 2016, I, th I think you're talking about like the, from my understanding, like that was really like the gold rush days of like fracking industry where like when we saw twenty tens, like everyone just saw fracking as like a new boom in, in the market, a new in source of like cheap energy. And the story was uh, uh, during this time, a lot of natural gas companies uh, like basically leveled up a lot, uh, basically expanded what costs necessary just to be, basically grow at a at, 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 at pace that they thought. And then gas prices suddenly came down, and then suddenly they were left with uh, a lot of production that they couldn't really sell. Uh, oh, sorry, the, 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 yeah. Uh, all demand came down, they left a lot of production they couldn't really sell. And then the CNX during this entire time, they have always maintained a, a one brick policy. They've always maintained a policy of we're going to, our, our first priority is uh, our production is going to cover our costs, and then we can, so surviving is the number one uh, thing. And then, so during the gold rush days, they never really expanded. They never really took on mm -hmm. that, that a lot of other companies did. Um, and even now, even last year, uh, you, when you saw the Ukraine Russian conflicts, a lot of these other companies increased production to benefit from the high gas prices. Cinex still just remains steady because I guess they, they're in it for the long term. Really. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. okay. um, so, so now, now we can uh, get, uh, we can ask questions for both, uh, for both speakers, right? For both presentations. So let's keep the balance. Um, can I just make a correction on that 110 percent figure? That was a typo. So the Asia Pacific market for Illmanai is actually 53 percent, not 83, which makes it not 110 percent. North America is 23 uh, percent. Middle East and Africa 10 percent. Uh, Western Europe 9 percent. So uh, it's 53 percent from the Asia Pacific. It's not that much. <laughs> okay. Uh, next one, so I think somebody wanted to ask something. Any yeah. questions yet? Yeah. Alex, if you want to come and peek, be closer. Oh, 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 yeah. oh, oh, I know. The next is you, okay? Sure, oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Oh. Okay. Well, this is a question for both of you. Really um, elaborate on inside the ownership and recent transactions. So I was just wondering what management, like what, what percentage they own of the company? And have you seen any insider transactions that would signal positively or negatively uh, regarding the So it's like it's either selling or buying, just so. I haven't, uh, that's an area I probably should look at. I just know that the uh, CEO has got close to 1% of the company. Um, I have, when it did come across my, you know, the you know, um, uh, when, when you look at, when you see the deals going through, I've never seen anything that's made me go, ah, they're really buying here, or they're really selling. Um, a lot of times it's options, um, I don't understand being specific, but I'd be right, I should look into that more and see. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and I've not looked at it recently, but I know so the CEO owns around, uh, definitely less than 1%, but then this is a $3 billion business. So. Um, I think uh, roughly around fifty million dollars worth of uh, dollars worth of shares, uh, but I, I believe around eighty five percent of his uh, CEO's conversation is tied to the share price performance. So they are very um, well aligned as regards to the shareholders. I don't think I'm not the other management, but the other thing I want to know was uh, the chairman, which is Wolf Dyke, the great capital allocator, of, quite so capital allocator. Um, he also owns around 30,000 shares in the Digital Trade Report, I think back in 2014, but he's held them since and he hasn't sold. Thank you. Next uh, question, please. Let me pass the mic. 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 And you know, if the return on uh, equity and the return on capital is quite high, why would they do that? Why would they just reinvest in the business, the, the, the final plans, you know, and so on? 
I think this is actually a function of what would, the question was before, the fact that it's a commodities business and the price goes up and down quite a lot. So they've seen that the, the price has actually been shooting up. It's gone from uh, $160 per ton to something like three dollars per ton um, uh, in the last few years. And they're like, okay, well, the price has gone up. We're going to return that cash rather than sit on it and invest it when we know our plan. Uh, that's what we're going to stick to, which is the capex spend. Um, and I, I think if you're a commodities business, give me the money back because I can reinvest it. I, I just feel that way personally about I'd rather have the money back than them going, yeah, we're going to expand into this and that. And then you don't know that since, you know, the big capex expenditures shares here. And they take quite a few years to, um, to develop. So it's not something you can just go, oh, we'll just put another rig in and it's shale. And it takes a while, so um, yeah, I think that's why. Yeah. I think, like, I'm yeah. personally quite happy with it. I'd rather so. uh, they gave me the money back and uh, buy a dividend, buy that person. Um, next question. I have a question if nobody has a question, but it's, it's for you this time. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, I, I think that the, this um, it, it was covered a bit. It was about uh, issue issuance of, of shares and dilution. But if you have seen that historically, like what scares me, like if you see that uh, for a twenty year period or something, that that goes like, and I and I and I, I know that what I like, even if it's a very cheap company in in multiples, if they tend to do that as a job, you know, issuing shares. That's not gonna work. That's what I have seen. Uh, but this might be for specific reasons. Let's say, so have you seen the historical issue of shares? And do you think that this a tendency of the management to just issue shares, or there were these specific problems, or and now since they are in production and they are more mature, they're not gonna they're not gonna issue shares anymore. Have you checked about that thing? Maybe 100 times yeah, issuance or something like that. If you see that, I think it is like this. Is like, yeah, so at that particular time, um, in 2015, that was when they China had a big blip in the in, in their demand and uh, the price of the, their produce really fell a lot and they had a large amount of debt. Um, and they, I think they just thought, let's sort this out once and for all and do it and we're done. So 2015 to now, it's been okay. Yes, it could be that part of the cycle is going to hit again and uh, the prices are going to fall. Yeah, that's a risk, but I don't particularly see, well, I don't know, you know, I don't know whether they're going to do this or not, but um, uh, yeah, I suppose it's a risk, it's a risk, but how, how do you know in a lot of cases, that happens with um, companies which have a large amount of debt and they did at the time. Uh, but if you look at, if you'd, if you'd held that, those shares through that period, you'd be doing okay now. You wouldn't have to, you know, if you if you, if you just go, yeah, I'll hang on, you'd be okay. So it's whether or not, whether or not that dilution leaves you worse off as a shareholder, I think, in the long run. So if you want to flip it in a couple of years, no, then, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a risk. So. But on the uh, commodities side, uh, I think your question before, there was a question about um, oh. whether or not the, the you know, it's, it's we're in commodities businesses. So yeah, the risk is is that the, the demand for pigments, uh, construction basically is going to come down. Um, the growth areas, I think, are in India, uh, particularly. Now, India is almost as big a population as China. It's a few years behind China um, in terms of how people are coming out into sort of the middle class where they do want homes with nice bathrooms, with nice you know, fittings and office space is going to increase in that way. Um, the usage of, of, of pigments is you know, like, uh, it's about, they say between two and four kilograms per person per year uh, in, in uh, Western world. 
developed countries, and it's 0.1 per kilogram in India. So if that's a big growth area, I think there's going to be kind of areas of the, the that, that kind of area is going to help drive drive things. Now, they've already got quite an established, in terms of energy use, it's already quite high. So I don't think you can say the same thing about um, oil and gas, for example, and say, well, India's going to drive the whole of the oil and gas industry, and so there's not going to be any problem prices. But I don't see it as, as um, being a long-term thing, uh, even if China does go through a major slump. That's my opinion. Could be wrong. Any other questions? Yeah. Thanks. So I have questions for both of you, but um, thanks both for the presentation. It's been very insightful. Um, I'll, I'll start with, with the first one. Um, I'm just trying to keep a sort of helicopter view of the business. Um, something that stood out for me with, with the sort of this sort of capex cycle where clearly they have to sort of move on to a different artificial lake. Um, what's that sort of frequency? Is that every three years and they have no well, different plants at the same time? Like, I'm just trying to think of like, if there's a certain, how much capex does it take to sort of move yeah, right. and how do I spread that out if I sort of try and make evaluation? So they're saying that their main plant, main uh, processor, which is uh, about half of their production, mm. that WCPA, is going to move there and stay there for the whole of its life. So they, that half, there's little you know, segments plotted out, that's it. So the useful life they're calling 20 years and they're saying um, it's going to stay there during that time if that's the high grade area. That they want to. So it's not going to be like a three year or five years we'll need to do this again and again. They started off with one of these things um, and slowly added second and the third. They might want to add more, but if they add more, that means they're going to generate more. Because this hit that's happened now with the massive amount of, of revenue um, and cash flow is because they've got these three up and running and they're going. So I think 20 years. That's going to sit there in this high grade area, and their B, B plant is also going to move up there and sit there in this high grade area. So I'm looking at you know 20 years. That's okay if you're buying a company for you know even five times its its average cash flow, free cash flow. Then I'm all right with 20 years. I think that's if that makes sense. It's cool. Makes sense. Yeah. 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 Um, but another question I had was regarding sort of basically. Russia, China getting cancelled and actual supply like disappearing off the market. You partially sort of diminish my concerns by pitching the India, which do believe in. Yeah. Um, what, what's your view on that? Like, how much is the sort of Ukraine effects a risk for this 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 pitch? Well, they said that they. Ken Matt and Luca both in their um, report said that uh, Russia and Ukraine are quite a, a large part supply, but neither, neither of them specified. So uh, I'd need to look at that and look at how what percentage is right. Maybe I should look at what how much that's going to pull that down. China does produce a lot of aluminium itself as well, but they are um, the chloride based process, which is less environmentally friendly. Um, in terms of what they what they have, so if they take a hit, so you're saying if their their demand goes, how much of, of the supply restriction is going to offset that? Is that your well? Well, oh, one thing I've seen in some other things I've sort of studied in the last couple of months was actually and this also is also might be interesting for you is I've I've come across um, a producer of um, fertilizers. Um, which suddenly saw a massive spike in demand because basically Russia was being cancelled, which is the biggest uh, producer of um, fertilizers in the world. Yeah. Um, and then took an instant pass of that. But um, what I'm trying to understand is like how much of the current demands for this company might actually, yeah, I'm trying to sort of spread it out historically and trying to see what, what is what is a normal demand and sort of which is why historically I've sort of shied away from 
technology companies, it's not feel like it can point. Um, then, then, then uh, an answer down on that one. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for, for that presentation. Um, don't know if I have any other questions. Um, Front second, so I'll just pass. Was it also for uh, for the other presentation in question or um, for everything? Was I think that, that was the main one, the sort of um, the Russia facts. I think what you presented uh, with that matrix, I think, was sublime. Um, that was really convincing for me. And I think also the pitch on the actual location of the gas grounds was it was a clear one that they are in fact the low cost producer, uh, especially for the sort of East Coast area. So then what I'm wondering is considering knowing that it's mainly the sort of Mississippi and middle region of um, the states, which is a, a big demand for sort of fertilizer, how much um, how much of um, gas supply actually affects fertilizer in the US, I guess. That's, that's one sort of area which, which I don't quite understand, and which you might have some insights on. It, it, it's the question, how much does natural gas pricing affect fertilizer? Uh, um, I guess it's also a bit more about the Russia effect, like how much does the states consume, and like how much import is there from Russia when it comes to fertilizers? Um, that's something I, I have no idea about. So, yeah, no, I'm actually uh, not sure, but that is definitely something to look into. Um, yeah, the one thing that really shocked me about one of the fertilizer things was just the amount of proportion of natural gas and the cost in the fertilizers. And the, the CEO of the fertilizer industry was saying that 79% of the production cost is natural gas, um, which is crazy, right? Um, I didn't think so. Um, one thing I did want to mention, I can't, the question that I didn't answer earlier was regarding the reserve base and what happens when event inevitably all as all come out businesses and they essentially run out of the reserves. Um, uh, CNF is around uh, a thousand. Excuse me, sorry. Um, I can't remember what the number was, but essentially they have sixteen years of reserve life if you take. The proven reserves and divided by uh, the annual production, which is like 570, 580. Um, they have about 16 years worth. Um, but the thing to know about that is that's from essentially uh, 100,000 100, acres of proven shale reserves. They also have 7,000, 700,000 acres that have been unproven and they've been untapped so far. So I always found that, that and now it might be that the remaining 700 is absolutely worthless. Um, but I always found that to be uh, the, eight, the 16 years, which is actually uh, pretty good for the industry, as long as you've got 10, which is fine. Um, and the thing is, the amount of acreage they do have um, should the existing proven reserves deplete. Um, yeah, I so, you know that um, there are also people uh, watching online through TradingView and, and Facebook. So, if they also have questions, you know, I can pass them to you. Uh, other than that, we can we can have one some last questions, and then we can we can continue the uh, the conversation offline. And those are one of the benefits when when you come when you come and attend the events in person. Uh, but if we if you have any any more questions, we can take one too. I think we can go offline. Uh, it's kind of a broad question, but what are the counter arguments to your thesis? So, what have other people said that would result in a short sale, but you disagree with? So, how do you, so what so what are the counter arguments, and how do you rebut those counter arguments? Uh, yeah, sure. So, uh, I think one of the main kinds of arguments uh, is that, so this year, essentially, is if you want to extrapolate out this year's performance going forward, well, this was, uh, if this year was a one-off. Um, so, like I said, this year, their production was, uh, they increased CapEx from, I think, 580 to 680. They increased CapEx by like, 100 million. And their production, essentially, I think, went down slightly by like 5%, like 2%, 3%. 
Um, and then so you, you can argue the case where, okay, so the existing asterisk has been less and less commercially efficient and wants to generate this and maintain the same amount of production that, that you, you extrapolate the capex to continue increasing at this rate, then very soon they're not going to be a very profitable business. Um, the only reason I, what made me feel comfortable about this was um, the reasons for why capex really, really increased this year, which was one, it's a function of inflation, right? And this year we had very high inflation. And the second thing is, it was the management's decision to increase the 1.5 rates. So they want, essentially, it was the delayed impact of once to take advantage of ex increasing uh, capacity to benefit from the high gas prices uh, last year. It just took, it took a while. Um, I did, management have always focused on one rig and one operationally should be around 500 million. Um, and so if they maintain that, and then if, if that one rig continues to use around 550 to 600 billion uh, cubic feet ECF per year, then, you know, uh, we did the maths earlier, but you essentially, even at the lower range, you know, $2, given the low cost base, it's, it's at least, you know, it's going to be a profitable business. And it's just a matter of, after that, it's, the gas prices do increase above that $2 mark, then it's all just essentially just upside for the company. Uh, for me, probably be the, the reasons about why I didn't like them, but what I thought were the risks, which are the country risk, the fact that they're in one operation, it's one mine, uh, in one place, so they're not really diversified. If you're looking at, like, you know, a uh, CNX or any other sort of major resources company, Rio Tinto, we've got lots of operations in different places, and that's a key risk because if anything happens to that particular mine for any reason, that's a big risk. The country risk is also there. I don't think, I don't feel like from what I've seen, the political risk is that high, but you never know what can happen. It can happen anywhere. Um, uh, and the risk. Yeah, so it's commodity and that type of thing. So if you can hold through, make the teeth and hold on to what you think is the price, that should normalize and be okay. If you're looking to get in and out, then get in in 2015, 2016. If you can actually find something, we could do that. And you know, that's a great time. If you wanted to buy a commodities company, that would be the perfect time to buy. Well, I've looking back actually at some of those uh, oil and gas companies actually. Um, People like Ethanol and you know, Shell, where they were at that time, and they were really, really, really depressed, really depressed massively. And if you could have seen that and gone into it, then you could have bought. So it's cyclical, well, that's the risk for me. Um, and I think the resources, you know, having a 16 year and a 20 year outlook is quite, you know, normal, but what, what's beyond that? You really don't know what's beyond that. And resources are. Um, Guaranteed. So, if you can try and get your money back, I think over the course of that time, then then that's why I'm I'm, I'm looking for a company that's going to pay out a lot rather than potentially reallocate that capital, and then you find out there's nothing left for 16 years. That's the, that would be the risk for me. Um, I did have a is that answer your question? Yeah, that's no, yes. um, I had a question for you actually. Um, uh, have you tried to work out? what you're paying in market cap terms per unit of what's in the ground. Like, for example, um, I've looked at uh, how much you pay for Shell's reserves based on their market cap. Like, what's the price that you're paying in market cap terms for a dollar of, you know, for a barrel of oil? So Shell was something like $21 um, per barrel, and I've got Equinor, the Norwegian one at eighteen dollars a barrel, and Oxy, which of course profit, is fourteen dollars a barrel. And I'm like, ah, that's why they bought, right? Because you can't really see it if you're looking at Oxy. It's like, why is it different from from anyone else? And, but if you look on that metric, it makes sense. So have you done that and compared with their beers and gone right? I'm getting this much in the ground that's proven, and I'm paying a lot less than unit. Is that not how you like them? Uh, I actually, I don't know my laptop. It's it's in my it's in the Excel file. I don't remember the actual numbers of it. Um, but were you comfortable? Was it? Yeah, so that? it wasn't anything like extreme. Was like right, right, right. Was it under? No, it's not. I think it was uh, so. One of the things where, uh, in terms of the way that CNX reports it, is they have around they report uh, so. Yeah, it's not that much. Actually. 
uh, and they're, they're poor. Um, that it's because they have a lot of coal and methane acreage and a lot of non shale acreage, um, which is not really cool to their operations, but it's just that they've really got leftover optimal kind of energy. Uh, and they're not really focused on that. And then, so they, a lot of their peers that they, they, they focus on their even shale reserves and even developed shale reserves and undeveloped shale reserves. Um, and then for CNX, they have a lot of um, essentially. Uh, Acreage that uh, a lot of their reserves are basically uh, non cooperational. And then, so it's like, do you really factor that in or not? I think when you factor that in, they are extremely, extremely cheap compared to their peers. When you don't factor in that in, I think they might have been slightly above, um, but I don't actually remember the figures to be able to tell you. Uh, anyone have any else? Anyone else? Okay. We'll get one last and then we'll go flying. Um, do you know where they can uh, get in from, which they have to pay off in 2015, 16? Uh, that was from CapEx to get going and spend on these, these flats. Uh, oh, okay. for me. Uh, but I don't know from these actually, so I should. And do you know how they plan on? Financing this next move. Please use the mic for sure, people. Uh, do you know how they plan on financing the CapEx for the next move? I guess they've learned from part mistakes. Have you heard in that management discussion about that? No, they, they've not said, but I would expect that they're hoping to do it from cash flows. Right. Um, if they can't, that might lead to an increase in debt. Um, they've reduced their debt from I don't remember exactly, it's 148 million down to, they've, they've dropped it a lot, so it's down to 18 so if they can get their debt down, they still have capacity to, to use debt to do it if they want to. Um, they've got 150 million um, debt capacity that isn't all used at the moment, so they could do it in that, hopefully the combination of that and Cash flow as well, but that's these are the risks. Uh, so, a big, big round of applause for both. Okay. And for the audience for the great discussion and the questions. So, now we will close the uh, the, the online streaming. Thank you for for watching the the show, and see you uh, next time. Thank you very much.